game three tonight. Can the Pacers get back on track? Haven't lost at home in a while. No, Ananobi. Some stuff clearing in the numbers that they can take advantage of. We'll talk about all of that today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Friday. Congrats. You made it through another weekend. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today, we're back at home from New York. Got to watch Caitlin Clark's first game in Indianapolis and the Pacers are back in Gamebridge Fieldhouse tomorrow, which if you've heard the show, if you saw the Pacers post, you know is where they've been great. Haven't lost there since March 18th and they need the wins. We're going to talk about the wins they need and how they can get them today. Game three tonight, game four on Sunday. What can the Pacers do better? Lots of stuff to dig into rotationally, defensively, offensively, who to attack, Slight lineup changes they could make, digging into some lineup data. Lots of stuff that we got into a tiny bit yesterday or throughout the week. But tomorrow we will, or tonight, (laughs) wow, we will really get into, as we get into the details of the numbers and say, what does this really mean for the Pacers? We actually start with the breaking news and the reason that Game 3 is now as vital as it gets for the Indiana Pacers, and that is that OG Ananobi is out not playing in game three. Jalen Brunson also questionable. I mean, I'd be shocked if he didn't play, but I don't know anything, obviously, just given the depth of the Knicks. Uh, OG Ananobi has a left hamstring strain. He's out for game three. Uh, Woj said unlikely for game four. Huge, huge. He had a sore left hamstring that made him leave game two when in 27 minutes and 54 seconds, he had 28 points and was terrorizing the Pacers. So that's massive if if Ananobi can't play for several reasons. The first one being similar to the Mitchell Robinson injury we talked about when that happened after game one. The Knicks are so thin, so thin. And so losing Mitchell Robinson for them wasn't just losing Mitchell Robinson. It's like they're down to seven credible players, right? Their starters, Deuce McBride and Alec Burks and Precious Achua. That's eight players, excuse me. Alec Burks only played 44 seconds. That's why I said seven. Um, They're running out of guys, and losing Ananobi means they keep running out of guys. They have four players who are not playoff guys, and they have four guys who are out, who are good for game three. That's eight of your 15. So they have seven reliable players. Now it's their starters plus Burks and Achua and McBride. Um, but one of them is going to have to start for Ananobi. So we will see what they end up doing. I would guess Precious Chu is going to start. He closed the game at the four for the Knicks. That's still a big group, but that's less shooting. That's less OG Ananobi. Uh, so what does that mean for this game and Knicks Pacers? And how can the Pacers take advantage, air quotes, of that? Um, because that's what they got to do. They've got to be better than the Knicks in the game, and they've got to really be better uh, in those minutes where Ananobi isn't playing he's been unbelievable right this is not a secret in the game that the Knicks just won uh game two he only played again 28 minutes of that game he was plus 10 the Knicks won by nine right obviously they were significantly better in his minutes in game one very similar uh he was excuse me I have the wrong tab open because I'm too slow in game one he was plus 12 they won by four obviously they go as their starters go but they really go as Ananobi Brunson their best players go So losing him is massive. He's been sensational uh, all throughout the series. He had, again, a career high in playoff points in the last game. And he's big on a Knicks team that isn't very big. So, like, you could just look through the matchup data and see that, right? The guy he guarded the most in both of the first two games was Pascal Siakam. Uh, The Pacers did not shoot very well guarded by Ananobi in game two. They did better in game one, largely because of Siakam. He spent 10 minutes on Pascal in game one, and he had two minutes on Obi Toppin. So that is the first thing that's going to happen is those two guys, and especially Pascal, have an easier time. And if you watched game two or you remember game two at all, right, you can just look at the time of defensive possessions to know this is the case. But either way, the second half, Siakam was better, right, Of uh, in that game. And that's game one. I keep pulling up the wrong freaking game tabs. Uh, he was better in the second half, got going a little bit with a chew on him. So 
that is perhaps something the Pacers can turn to, right? If he can get find some space to wiggle and score, and there'll be other stuff that's going to matter with him. But that's the first thing that could matter here is it's just easier for Siakam. This will help the Knicks rebounding, but they're going to have more chances to rebound because Achua can't finish as many plays as uh, Ananobi can. I mean, Ananobi's killing them, right? He had 10 of the first 18 points in the last game, and he's been blowing. And, and the other thing that uh, Ananobi Pascal lineup or uh, matchup featured is I think three times in the first quarter of game two, a poor closeout from Siakam where he like lunged weird or ran too far. OG Ananobi just got right by him, got to the basket. So this changes a lot, right? He's the best Knicks defender. We talked before the series on this show. Should he guard Siakam? Should he guard Halliburton? Knicks have obviously made the right choice there. So what does this do, right? If, if Chua starts, they're not smaller. Right, they're still a big unit. The Knicks are. Their bench is really small. Then their bench is just Burks, McBride. So they're a smaller team, and they can't run a Chua and Hartenstein forever. So there will be moments where their four man is jo Josh Hart. Maybe you could say is the four nominally. You could say maybe it's Alec Burks is nominally the four for a few minutes. He played in the rotation. He got in the first half for 44 seconds of game two. You get the gist though. They're light on bodies. So they'll, I, again, I'm guessing, I don't know this, I'm guessing they'll start Hartenstein and Achua, and then those two will be permanently one of them at center, and then often both of them on there. So when they're not out there is when the Pacers have to crush, 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 crush. They, The Pacers, can you believe it, given how the season started, the Pacers will have a big size advantage there. And we saw in the last game these three big man lineups work really well. We'll talk more about those with, with more data later. I keep saying big men, but like they're not versatile players out there. But it was basically a guard, right? Whoever, it was usually TJ McConnell. Shooter, Ben Shepard, right? And then three capable, versatile bigs. Uh, often it was Isaiah Jackson, Pascal Siakam, Obi Toppin. Sometimes it was Miles Turner. We even saw in the first series Jalen Smith with Toppin Siakam in game one of Pacers Box. I don't think we'll see that. But either way, you get the gist. They've gone through this a little bit, and they've seen it work very well against the Knicks already and that includes playing against Ananobi in these first two games without him that group that already had a size advantage because of the size deficiencies the Knicks had at the three right their small forwards have been Dante DiVincenzo their small forwards have been Josh Hart or Alec Burks or whoever are not big players and so the Pacers have been able to get away with these big lineups because they have a size advantage at the three whether that's because of Siakam whether that's because of a switch on the top and whether that's because there's more panic when a switch comes onto a guard, a.k.a. T.J. McConnell. Those have worked really well in this series. And now they're even better. One, because they can still hold the same advantage they had before. But now there's a Knicks lineup that will have to be played by the nature of their thinness that it will work even better against, right? It should be able to punish smaller Knicks lineups even more than it already has. And so just looking at Ananobi's defense, this is obviously a big win for the Pacers that's a, an amazing defender who's guarded Siakam let the series gone, and it's a chance for them to use their best lineups in more advantageous situations. Uh, like, duh, and an OB out is good for the Pacers. That's not a good offensive series. 28 points in, 20, in under 28 minutes in game two says a lot about what he can do. Losing him as a shooter, I wonder how the Pacers will adjust defensively, and we'll talk about the defensive end to start this second segment, but he's been killing on that way as well. He's making threes. He would shot fake threes and get to the rim. He was, you know, dunked monstrously twice in the series, right? Like he's been very good on that end too. And Achua is fine on offense. He had the 16 offensive rebound game, I believe, or 16 rebound game with a bunch of offensive rebounds against the Pacers in the regular season. And he had, you know, four made shots and five boards and three offensive rebounds in his 28 minutes of game two. But he also had four fouls and was a minus 14. Like, clearly the Pacers did well against Achua. He can't do the stuff Ananobi does offensively, too. So, clearly, I think the bigger loss for the Knicks, because Brunson has the ball all the time and how they play, is losing Ananobi hurts their defense a lot. You know, they're plus a bajillion. Their, their on-off net rating with him is insane. Like, he's a very valuable player. Had he played 24 minutes, 23 in game two, the Pacers probably would have won. He got to 28. That was enough. But this is huge. This is a chance for the Pacers to beat an incredibly crippled Knicks team. They're so banged up. They have got to take advantage of it. And they've got to attack the holes that Ananobi's absence allows them to attack, whether that's on offense with Siakam now having a more favorable matchup, whether that's 
on offense with their big lineups against smaller Knicks groups that are going to happen in general when either Achua or Hartenstein is the only big on the floor or whether that's being more successful on the defensive end because Achua can't punish them in the ways Ananobi can. Can't hit the threes, Ananobi can. It hurts their spacing. All these ways mean the Knicks are worse without OG Ananobi. Duh, they traded a lot to get him. Pacers have to take advantage of that. That The fact that this is game three, they're back at home, it's critical that they find a way to beat the Knicks tonight with the level of banged up that they are, especially if Brunson isn't 100%. Massive game for the Pacers. The Ananobi absence only adds to what we could see uh, as issues for the Knicks in game two. There's plenty more I want to talk about ahead of this game. More numbers, more digging into stuff that has been good and bad for the Pacers throughout the series. Looking ahead at game three and beyond. Before we talk about any of that, though, Let's talk about two wonderful groups of people. The first up, the good folks over at Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app. More than 3 million users. All you do, pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. March is over, but the NBA playoffs are rolling. So are the NHL playoffs. You can up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks right now as the world's best players take the game to a new level during the postseason. You can up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with a little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 with basketball, hockey, and Earlier this month, you could have done college basketball entries on Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. They have something for every sports fan, from basketball to hockey to League of Legends. And it's simple to play. You can do it, make your picks in a minute or less, safe, quick withdrawals. All you got to do to play, show up, pick your sport. Steph Curry, more than or less than 29 points, for example. He's not playing anymore. Or Kayla Clark for more than or less than 30 points. That's how you play on Prize Picks. Download the app today and use the code Lockdown NBA for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars on Prize Picks. Again, download that app today and use the code Lockdown NBA for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars at Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Let's also talk about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience—the winning formula for championships—is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want. It's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusion supply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. We are back here on Locked On Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Jump on over to Locked On NBA. Hear me and Wes Goldberg on the Cavs beating the Celtics. Wow. Uh, and also the Mavs beating the Thunder with Luca Hobbling and the Suns fire. Former Pacers head coach Frank Vogel. That's silly. I like Mike Budenholzer, though. Uh, we talk about all that on Locked on NBA. It's a good episode. I highly recommend you encourage. I highly encourage you to check it out. Not just because I'm on it, but because it's a good episode. Um, other Pacers stuff that I want to dive into. Let's talk about uh, j- some defensive stuff for the Pacers in this game. There's been a lot of discussion about this, specifically Jalen Brunson and who is guarding him. I have brought this up myself, but I've also been asked about this a lot on various other outlets, right? And it's been Andrew Nemhard, but then in the first quarter, you saw it flip a little bit to Aaron Neesmith, uh, and it's just a team effort. McConnell's been on him. Uh, lots of guys have ended up on Jalen Brunson throughout the series. And he's been unbelievable. He's kind of torturing everybody. So here's what my new thinking is about who is guarding Jalen Brunson. It doesn't matter. And that, it doesn't matter not because he's going to score on everybody. That's not what I think the case is right? There are guys who can deter him better than others. TJ McConnell has done the best, right? That's obvious. We've watched the games. Why I think it doesn't matter so much is every time he's coming around a screen or a lot of times he gets space, the Pacers are sending him two guys. It doesn't matter who your one is as much. If there's a second defender coming, what matters more in that moment is what happens behind the play in the four on three. Can guys recover to shooters? Can guys stop Isaiah Hardenstein barreling down the lane for his funky tastic floater? That's such an awesome shot. He just drills it. You know, can guys rotate out to help the Brunson trappers get back into space quickly enough that there's not just an open shot somewhere else? And so a lot of times what you saw, like this happened, I think, three times in game two, 
Brunson comes around a screen. Two defenders go to Brunson. He passes to Hardenstein. Hardenstein whips to the opposite corner. DiVincenzo is usually the guy, but I think there was one other one. Hits a three, right? Brunson creates that basket. Hardenstein gets the assist, but Brunson creates that basket. And really, the Pacers' defense is why it's even possible for that sequence to be so easy. And I bring up a sequence like that, not maybe that specifically, but like that, that happens so often in these games to say, that doesn't matter who the Brunson defender was on that play. What mattered is, do they have the best guy behind the play who's able to tag Hardenstein if they need to or get out to a shooter or X out or just execute backline defense really well? Because I don't think you can really stop Jalen Brunson. The only thing that stopped Jalen Brunson so far in this playoffs is his own feet, right? Which may, he's questionable for game three. I'm Again, I'm assuming he's playing. Like, I would try, if I'm the Pacers, to just keep Nemhard on him and make sure the rest of my team the bigger guys or whoever's fast or whoever's in the game to just be ready to rotate behind the play. Right? If my, if the trap is an Emhart plus someone else, whoever the other three guys are, have to be ready to fly around and not give up easy shots and not have whims, flimsy closeouts. And that's so much easier said than done against the Knicks because they've been beating everybody. But that is where I think that discussion ends for me. I no longer think that it's about who should guard Brunson. It's about how they guard the rest of the Knicks in those moments. And because of that, I think the answer is just stick the best guard defender on the floor on him because that's going to provide the least deterrence from a size perspective on the back line. And so almost always, in fact, I can't think of a situation it wouldn't be the case, that's going to be Nemhard or McConnell. And then you try to make sure you win every other little battle that happens uh, over the course of a possession, right? The back line has to matter the most. And so I think McConnell and Nemhard should be the guy like, DiVincenzo has been killing the Pacers in these games on these threes, right? Six for 12 in game one. I believe he was five for nine from deep in game two. And they feel like a hundred threes because I swear every time the Pacers are on a 5-0, 6-0, 6-1, 6-2 run, whatever, they're making a little bit of a comeback, catching up a little bit, right? Feels like, oh boy, no, maybe the Pacers can do something here. Could be a close game again. DiVincenzo hits a three. He hits the most timely threes I've ever seen. And he's been doing it for two rounds. He is not rattled by any sort of moment. Um, Trying to make his life harder, I think, is worth it, right? And I know that there's another discussion to be had of you just let Brunson go crazy and shut down the DiVincenzos of the world. That has a little more meaning to me now that Brunson's banged up, but I don't. Oh, you can't let stars get rhythm and see the ball go through the net and just have all that happen to them, right? I understand that thinking. Like Josh Hart's worst game of the playoffs in that first round, Sixers beat them, right? If DiVincenzo cools off, are they are they winning all these games? Who knows? But he's not cooling off. He's a very good player. He's going to make open threes. So that's something I think about for the Pacers is making sure their best closeout guys with speed and ability to read the game have to be the guys on the back line. And thus those can't be the guys guarding Jalen Brunson on a specific possession. I think that what they've done uh, makes the most sense. Speaking of Brunson, let's flip to the other side of the floor. I've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, and I want to really hammer it home. If whoever Brunson is guarding needs to be more involved in the action for the Pacers to me, right? This was a key adjustment in game six of Bucks Pacers, right? We saw it in game five. Brooke Lopez is, is on Aaron Neesmith, and that kind of flummoxed the Pacers. They would run their thing, and nothing would be there. The, the Bucks would switch, and then you know it's all funky, and where's the mismatch? And by the time they assess all that, they need to reset, and so Halliburton would get the ball at the top, and they would try to flatten out, and then he'd try to attack, and it's already been 15 seconds, and now you can't get into and then they don't score. And that was credit to the Bucks defense, and the Pacers figured that out in game six, and that was a long explanation to say. Late second quarter, the Bucks go back to that. Lopez is on Aaron Neesmith for the second game in a row. And one of the first possessions of that alignment, Neesmith runs up like he's going to set a screen for, I believe, Tyrese Halliburton. I'm almost certain it was Halliburton. And the Bucks. Are a little confused. Uh oh, what do we do if he sets the screen? We probably should guard Tyrese Halliburton instead of Aaron Neesmith. But then he doesn't set a screen, he sets a go screen. But Brooke Lopez was so planted on the fact that he's going to be dropping below a screen to guard Halliburton that he just stands stationary. And then the Bucks mess up the coverage and Neesmith hits a three. And they did that because they dragged a defender who didn't make the most sense on a perimeter player into the action. And so I went through the Brunson lineup data numbers with you at the, or the Brunson, the Ananobi lineup data numbers with you earlier. In the episode, right, that he's defended very well throughout the series so far. Brunson, mm, eh, not uh, 
not known for I mean, he's a fine defensive player for his height. Like he tries really hard. He works his tail off and just like every Knicks player is, is doing good stuff. But, you know, the Pacers shot 100 percent. According to the NBA's matchup data, the Pacers shot 100 percent on shots. Brunson was the closest contester for in game two in game one. Here's Brunson as the closest defender stats. McConnell, five for six. Isaiah Jackson, one for one. Andrew Nemhard, 0 for one. Two for four for Miles Turner, two for two for Pascal Siakam. Uh, that is 10 for uh, 13 with Brunson as the closest defender. AKA, attack that guy if you're the Pacers. Try to, at least. That's not that simple, right? The, the Knicks are doing stuff on purpose to try to not have that be the case or just be something the Pacers can do over and over again. But... Even if he's on Neesmith or whoever, what happens with OG out and changes how and how often he ends up and switches or ends up out of the play, whatever. I'm not going to rehash all the situations. You get what I'm saying. Whoever he's on, if it's Yakum, if it's Neesmith, if it's a bench player, if it's Toppin, if it's Shepard, that guy I think needs to set more screens or just be more involved around the play. And that hasn't happened as much as I thought it would. Uh, and that's credit to the Knicks and their defense. And that's uh credit to Brunson and that's not as much of a credit to the Pacers who can fix it though uh and I think they need to attack him a little more without getting mismatch on D they very clearly are out of their game when they mismatch on and also to add to that one more thing if his foot is hurting then you really should be attacking him right so uh it's all over uh that to me I've, I've kind of covered the bases but I think that is something that I will be Looking out for in this game, can they find a way to attack Jalen Brunson more with a foot injury? And if they do that, is he more exhausted for his own offense, which will matter quite a bit? Uh, let's get to one more segment, looking at some lineup data. So the guys, the Pacers should be playing more, how they can do it if they need to, what that's all going to look like if they make adjustments. Heading in to game three before we talk about any of that, though. We have got to talk about Monopoly Go pausing here to tell you about them because i know what you're saying technical foul you already talked about that including yesterday but there's so much good stuff in the game i'm gonna keep telling you about them in monopoly go you can team up with your friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards the more you win together the more awesome prizes you unlock and there's so much to get unique stickers you can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes Cool new playing pieces to travel the boards with. Hilarious emojis for taunting friends. Sounds like my kind of thing. When you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like digging for treasure or a robot pachinko machine. There's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download it for free on the Google Play or App Store. Game on. We're back here on Locked On Pacers. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every single day. Your second listen should, of course, be Locked On Knicks. Hear about the other side of this series from those guys up in New York. I had a great time in New York City. Uh, no one asked, but I, I very rarely am so opinionated on a city that I want to blurt it out, although I did that about Milwaukee in the first round, too. New York is fun. Um, I had a great time exploring and I have thoughts about New York. If anyone wants to ask about it, because billboards that are interesting to look at how, how have they made billboards fun? Uh, let's talk about the basketball series that's happening and not billboards. Um, the lineups We've talked about this a lot. People have been talking about this. Why didn't TJ McConnell close game two? Well, the, the easy response would be, well, the other guards were also playing very well, but like, do you want to go small and put him in for Aaron Neesmith or put a, put him in for a center for, I mean, there's a lot of, thinking that goes into this right and naturally you have to look at lineup data as i do um let's start with this of the pacers most played lineups in the series so far their most played lineup is the starters duh uh that group is minus 16 per game <laughs> not going well that's points per game raw i'm not doing that ratings doing raw points uh not well not doing well together their second most played lineup is McConnell, Siakam, Toppin, Jackson, Shepard, a.k.a. Pascal plus the bench with McConnell in there. That group is plus nine on the series, plus 4.5 per game. Their third most used group is, this is just the Knicks series, McConnell, Turner, Siakam, Halbert, and Shepard. So like a mix and match of starters and bench with TJ McConnell. Their third most used lineup in the series is McConnell, Turner, Toppin, Halbert, and Neesmith. So the same group I just said, but Neesmith instead of Shepard. So a little more starter heavy. McConnell's in that group. Uh, and then the next most used group is McConnell, Siakam, Nemhard, Jackson, Shepard. Look at that. I mean, McConnell and Benjamin starter combo. 
The top five lineups used for the Pacers in this series all feature McConnell, which is just to say he's been a part of a lot of mixing and matching groups in this series. And of those groups, they're almost all positive by quite a bit, right? His plus minus has been good. The bench has been good in this series. Siakam's a part of a lot of those as well. Uh, I was something I was talking about in the first round, making sure they're paired for their skill sets. I think that that has... You know, maybe not necessarily been intentional, intentional in this round, but it's working very well. It probably is. Uh, it's working very well for the Pacers. And I think that the thesis should be twofold. One, McConnell plus other ball handlers works. It can't be just him running the show, though. The ones where it's just him are not nearly as effective. Particularly, I think Siaka makes a lot of sense with him. Two is he works well against the Knicks, who don't do what the Bucks did and go zone which really makes it hard for him to get to his spots and play the way he wants to play. And we've seen that be a big thing throughout the series. Uh, so three is if they're going, man, shooters are very valuable, which is why these lineups have, you know, Toppin and Shepard together who are both shooting well in this series or Shepard and Halliburton together who are shooting well in this series or Toppin and Halliburton who are shooting well in the series and Neesmith who in theory can shoot well, but hasn't or uh, Nemhard and Shepard as your shooters. That one has plus four per game, but doesn't have as much shooting. Either way, it's easier to make those groups work. And the lineup data says McConnell should probably be playing a little more, right? Every group he's been with, even if it's unique and mixed and matched and different than what is normal for him, for the second unit, for the Pacers, whatever, it goes well. And I think he can defend Brunson pretty well, at least pestily. Uh, no one can really stop Jalen Brunson. And his ability to get into the paint really is taxing on the Knicks. Uh, I think McConnell's got to play a little more. And he's already been over 20 minutes both games in this series. Uh, he was at 22 in game one and 23 in game two. And I don't know what would be like where his effectiveness drop off is, right? Because in the regular season, he played more than 25 minutes eight times, right? He played 23 minutes, for example. I just mentioned it. He played 23 minutes uh, in game two. Two, he played more than 23 minutes 11 times during the regular season, right? So just saying, oh, up his minutes. Like, it sounds so easy. It's not that simple. Like, if he could go that fast and that hard and be that effective for 30 minutes, you'd think they would do it. So I'll be fascinated to see. I think he should play more. I think they recognize that they were fielding questions about it. Where and how they do that, right? And if it actually helps, right? Because that means someone else is not in the game, but he's been unbelievable in the series. I think they have to continue to try to pursue McConnell on the floor groups if he's going to be this good on both ends. And again, with the NNOB out, they're just not very big. So they can find places to play McConnell plus another guard that doesn't just totally kill them in a way that Milwaukee did or a lot of other teams in the NBA can. This isn't rocket science. We talked about it yesterday, but McConnell is playing well. The Pacers are winning when he's out there. That kind of player should probably play more. The thing with lineup changes in general is it's very risky because if it goes wrong, um, your season can be on life support rotations are very sticky for a reason. We just saw the thunder it was a big deal. They played Shea Gildas Alexander the whole fourth quarter. He usually sits to start the fourth. They lost that game. That's not why, but still it's very tricky to do those kinds of things, but you don't want to just too late in the playoffs either. I think we'll see a little more McConnell in game three. I'm not sure how much more the other lineup data stuff to get into is with Siakam topping on and either Turner, Smith, or Jackson on. So this is the three big groups for the Pacers. This is the whole playoffs. This includes the Bucks series. Uh, the Turner, Siakam, Toppin, Shepard, McConnell group is plus two. The Siakam, Toppin, Jackson, Shepard, McConnell group we just talked about is plus nine, and they've played a lot, 15 minutes. The Siakam, Toppin, Smith, McDermott, McConnell group is minus six, and then Siakam, Toppin, Smith, Shepard, McConnell is plus two, a.k.a. McConnell is also in all of these three big lineups, which, I mean, they've worked, but I'm dying to know if the Pacers go to those, if they use a different point guard. Can that work with Halliburton? Can they get by? Those groups have shot it really well from 342.9% so far in this series. Is that propping them up, or is there really something to this? Are they truly that spectacular? Their defense has been unbelievable, under one point per possession for the Knicks against those three big groups. And that's helped them get in transition, play their best. Can they work well with different combinations when that transition isn't TJ McConnell and Ben Shepard also in a lot of those as well. You've got to have shooting. If you're going to go with the bigs, 
perhaps like Halliburton Neesmith or Halliburton Shepard, whatever. I'll be curious how those look and what those stretch out to be in game three, because I think there's something to those, especially with the smaller Knicks team. It's the Pacers job to try to figure out how to exploit them among many other things that you'll see potentially tonight for the first time game three game at field house. I'll be there. Can't wait. I just go to basketball games. Now, apparently I am absolutely loving it. Thank you all so much for listening and making it a possible reality tomorrow. Of course, we're rocking through the weekend shows again because the series is going. Uh, I'll probably have a guest over the weekend, although I have family in town. I definitely want to have somebody on after game four or after game three, excuse me, and maybe after game four. Uh, so expect a guest tomorrow night if I am good at foresight and planning. And then we'll see how the weekend goes with family in town and getting all that set up. But I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you guys are too. I am on Twitter slash X, whatever, at Tony R. East. The show is there at Locked on Pacers. Back tomorrow talking whatever happens in game three. Tell then everybody have a wonderful day.